I'm also a special guest. I invited myself to this, to this conference. I want to introduce some thoughts which I don't think I'm qualified sufficiently to speak about. But I have been compelled by God to at least make some statements, which is one of the primary purposes of our corporate gathering. It's to scatter seed. I love the parable of all parables. It's Matthew chapter 13, the first parable. I love it for a simple reason that if we do not understand that parable, we would not understand the secrets of the kingdom. And that parable is a key that unveils hidden dimensions of God's kingdom to us. And a part of that parable interpreted simply means that you need a preacher, a kerux, not anyone who stands behind the pulpit, a kerux, who is a sower. One of his descriptions, descriptors is that he is a sower, and he sows seed, which Peter tells us is the incorruptible word of God, the incorruptible, uncontaminated word. And the good ground that heals fruit um, 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold and are those who have the capacity to hear. But the fundamental principle of that parable is that those who are sent from the mount of, of the Lord to bring his word can only sow seed to those who have developed the skill of a listening ear. So capacity to receive the word is determined by how your ear has been anointed to listen. Because we can have eyes and ears but not see nor hear the things that God wants to say. And perception is a fundamental prerequisite to, access, to accessing the secrets of God's kingdom. And I want to scatter seed. And I think all of the preachers here cannot finish sermons. You will find that one of the characteristic features of this apostolic season is that you cannot finish a sermon but you can, by the Spirit, deposit seed. One sows, another waters, but only God gives the increase. So it's in that context I want to scatter some seed thoughts by talking about a subject that's unrelated to everything that has been discussed here. Obviously it has been We've insinuated it and made reference to it, but not yet discussed it. I was toying on the idea of releasing a set of teachings which has just been freshly baked into my spirit on love, which I've heard John Alley and others make reference to, including Segi. And uh, I want to talk about a place called Hebron, how oneness is going to get married to love to produce Hebronic communities that will be known as the community of the beloved. But God would not allow me to do that. I wrestled through the night with wanting to share that. He said, I want you, even if you're unqualified, to speak on the kingdom of God. So I want to share some thoughts. And the reason I'm doing it, I feel compelled to think that we're about to see a manifestation of God's kingdom in, in, in the earth like we've not seen it before. I know the kingdom is invisible and it does not come by observation, but I really believe there's going to be an incarnation and a demonstrative manifestation of the kingdom of God. But in doing that, I want to scatter some thoughts and provoke you to think because most of us have inherited our view of the kingdom from the latter reign, 
teaches. And there's been an, a great emphasis on the kingdom of God to the point where we think that the centrality of whatever we do is the kingdom. I don't find that anywhere in the teachings of the apostles. For example, in Colossians chapter 1, the Bible tells us about the obsession and the passion that people like the Apostle Paul had when he spoke about Christ being formed in every man. But at the same time, I know that our, our representation of Christ in the earth is expressed and defined by our understanding of the kingdom. And I'll explain that a little later on. But the kingdom of God is a very important aspect and we need to understand it. But to understand the kingdom of God, there's something happening. And, and I think Segi spoke about the knitting, the joining, and he made some references to it in the, in the, in the context of his teaching. But one of the unique things that's happening in this season is that remnants of truth that were polished and prepared in different sections um, of, the, of the construction site. Uh, and if you understand the building of the, t the Temple of Solomon, there was no sound of a hammer or chisel heard on the temple site. All of the stones all of the stones were cut out from the mountain, chiseled, hammered, shaped, polished by the mountainside, and was carried to the, 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 mount, the, to the temple site. And there, the stones were jointly fit together without mortar, without cement. And if they did not fit together, they had to go back to the quarry site and they had to be further prepared so that they would fit. And, and, and Peter introduces to us the idea of being jointly fitted together. Uh, Paul uses the word being knitted together. Uh, Segi spoke about being weaved together. There's a fabrication that takes place according to the architectural designs of God. There's no doubt about that. What I'm beginning to realize more and more that at least a lifetime of sermons who, which, are, which are stones of truth are now coming together to construct the tabernacle of God. What we saw in isolation, we are now seeing from, in a synoptic, if not from a heavenly perspective. We're seeing things in a more complete picture. Uh, we, in the past, we looked at things in isolation. Presently, we have to look at things all together. That is the merging of heavenly truths with earthly constructs. Let me give you a scripture. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 to 29. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. The, the language here in the Greek is present continuous, which means that he has spoken and he will continue to speak. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. So he spoke on earth and he spoke from heaven, the speakings of God. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised a, a, a saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal, and the word for removal here is the word metathesis, very powerful word, which speaks about the transference of principles, and you know that the word thesis is a word very common to academic language. Uh, most of us that, that, that study postgraduately uh, degrees and so forth, have to complete a thesis at least as a step towards the acquisition of a degree. Um, and um, here it's, God, God is talking about how certain eternal principles are transferred to new hard drives, new systems that can, can, take, that can contain the glory. And there has been a literal transference from one operational system to another operational system through the speakings of God 
from the beginning of God's dealings with humankind. There's no doubt about that. Yet once more indicates the removal of those things which are being shaken here literally means tested, proven, attested, validated, authenticated as things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. And an old test that comes through, and the word for shaken here is a word that's borrowed, I think, from the book of, uh, is it uh, Habakkuk? Let me just read it to you. Uh, Haggai, Haggai chapter 2, verse 20 to 23. Uh, and the word shake there is a metaphoric, a very beautiful picture of the, the, of, of the stampeding of horses. And they cause the earth to literally shake, and horses speak about systems uh, or governmental systems uh, that, um, that will cause uh, certain shakings or the government of God will cause shakings to take place in the earth so that the things that, that, do, that cannot be shaken will remain. And so God is always, you know, the principle of upgrade is a very powerful principle that resonates with Scripture. We may find technological ways of describing it, but the principle of up upgrade is very simply that you may upgrade your devices, but the fundamental principles uh, 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 remain at their naked level to be true to itself. For example, the cell phone, when we first had it, it was such a huge device. You had to be a bodybuilder to carry it. <laughs> and, um, uh, but, it was, but the principle of the cell phone, it may have been modified and upgraded, but the principle remained even though certain systems were upgraded. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Similarly with God, the eternal principles are always true to itself, but, but the structure that houses the principles will always get upgraded. That's why we cannot talk about form and function without talking about design. An eternal design determines our form and our function in the earth. And yes, God is a God of, of upgrade by shutting down or by uprooting or tearing down and then reestablishing. And we can see the evolution of the developments of God in portions of scripture uh, uh, that can be traced back to the first altar that was built. And that altar much later would become a tabernacle under the ministry of Moses. And, uh, and the tabernacle, uh, you know, under the ministry of people like David and uh, Solomon would become a temple. And eventually that temple will get demolished to become an eternal temple that would be made up of the body of Christ, that is you and me, past, present, and future. Uh, and, and so the systems are always upgrading, but the eternal principles never change. They are true to themselves. Uh, superstructures can change, but the substructure will always be true to itself. They are eternal principles. So it's in that context that we have to understand that there are many shakings taking place with the ultimate objective that only the things that cannot be shaken would remain. It is in that context verse 28 is given to us. Therefore, since we are receiving since we are receiving. And look at how it is it's saying, it's, it does not say we have received. Therefore, since we are receiving. There is an embrace or a reception uh, which is determined by your accommodation. You know, there's a, uh, we, I learned this and we learned this in this, uh, through all the teachings in the schools from different speakers, that, um, that reception uh, the reception of somebody is preceded by the recognition of that person. For example, you would not receive a stranger into your home unless you can recognize the stranger. And only after you've received him, you could then receive the reward, which could be a visitation of God. Are you with me? So, so how we perceive a matter determines our reception of it and the subsequent reward of that. Similarly, if we do not have the right perception or recognition of how the kingdom comes, we will not receive it. We will not receive it because this is a present continuous principle, which means that I must know how to receive the kingdom. Uh, and when the things that remain are established, then the Bible says we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. 
cannot be shaken. It's indestructible, indomitable. It's been tested to be firm and steadfast. Uh, it is absolutely trustworthy or reliable, which cannot be shaken less we have grace. And uh, I mean, sorry, I beg your pardon. Which cannot be sh shaken. And listen to the statement. To receive the kingdom. Let us have grace. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably. Look at the words here. Receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Let us have grace that we may serve God. Serve God. And you'll see how all this will tie up to kingdom principles shortly. Serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. I heard God very clearly say to me, there is going to be a demonstrative manifestation of his kingdom, but it is going to be determined by the people who know how to not only be recipients of that kingdom, but administrators of it. And the kingdom of God cannot just be preached. It has to become a means by which we see it established. There's a portion of scripture that's, that's very prophetic. It was fulfilled in the patent son called Jesus the Christ, but it must also be fulfilled in the corporate son, which is the body of Christ. This is found in Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7. I want you to follow me very carefully. I'm laying a foundation to some of the things I want to say here. And remember at the back of your mind, there's an integration of various truths that must be married before you will see the kingdom come. One of the biggest problems we've had in the church is that we have seen the kingdom and spoken of it, but we have not allowed for the necessary, the prerequisite steps to be established before we would see the actualization of that kingdom. So we've talked kingdom, but we've not seen the realization of it. And what's the reason for that? Because we put the cart before the horse. Yes, the ultimate is to establish his kingdom, um, which I will describe shortly to you, but you cannot establish it until we get certain fundamentals in our lives right. So let's look at a few things. For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. I want you to mark these words because I'm going to magnify them for you shortly. Because Jesus' ministry did not start when he said the kingdom is coming. There was a preparatory dimension before he could announce the kingdom. And there's multiple steps to it. And part of it is a child is born, a son is given. And you cannot talk kingdom if you don't understand sonship, divine sonship. The ultimate level of why God brought us into a selvic position. Why salvation is such a reality. For unto us a child is born... And to us, a son is given. And, and this is very common to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, God did not speak about after the fall of Adam and Eve that he's going to give them a kingdom. All he said was, the seed of a woman will bruise the head of the serpent. We have to read into the text what God is saying. For unto us, a child is born. For unto us, a son is given. And that took in Jesus' life 30 years. Emmanuel, the pre-existent Christ, the eternal one, the, 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 the Logos, the one who created all things, um, he had to become a son. And it was a process of 30 years, according to the attestations of God, the pre-existent I'm talking about. I'm not so, talking about an adopted son. I'm talking about the eternal son. So this, this is a very important principle. And his name will be called... Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. And there's a few words here. The one is order, the primary, the primary meaning of this word. Uh, and this is a verb. And this, and this verb, order it, uh, has an action to it. Uh, and it speaks about to cause something to stand in an upright position. 
So when we're talking about ordering the kingdom, we're talking about how can the kingdom come to stand in its upright, fixed, and steadfast position. And, and, and that's not going to happen in a vacuum. It's going to happen, uh, you know, before, un, un, until, uh, it will not happen until certain prerequisites are in place. That's what God said to me. That's why this is such a poignant time and listening to messages and sonship and so forth are so critical to understanding the advancement of the kingdom because we do know today that woe is the land whose king is a child, but blessed is the land whose king is a son of nobility. And God never say to David uh, in Psalm 2, ask of me for the nations without first saying, today I will declare the declaration, you are my son. Okay. After the decree is released, then he says, you have the right now to ask for the nations. Many of us in our prayer meetings are asking for nations, and we, have, you know, we, we, we can't even have some meat in our refrigerators. But we want nations, simply because we've never understood that sonship is not a, a theoretical uh, privilege. It is actualized through a process of development and growth. And so this word means, um, um, when we speak about the kingdom here, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment, the word order here means to bring the kingdom to an upright, fixed, and steadfast position where it will not be moved. It's an unshakable kingdom. It also means, the word establish means to, 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 to energize something. And it speaks about how a people could energize this kingdom. So there's some key principles here. So if we want to order something and establish it, if we're going to bring it back to its upright position, then there has to be an energizing of it. If you go to the original words, how do we strengthen something? How do we energize it? How do we sustain it so that the kingdom is not here for a moment and then it disappears because of corruption or because of the weakness of the church, etc.? So these are statements. But I want to also read into the record of this, of this gathering um, a couple of prophecies. Because I, I believe that when we read these words, like in the days of Daniel, when he studied the, the prophecy of the 70 years of, uh, of captivity and he knew that that time was re reaching an end, he had to now travail until that prophecy became a reality. And I think... Amongst us here, we have to understand that while the kingdom has been announced and it came with, with the announcements of Christ, there has to be a people in the earth that will come to steward the purposes of God. Amen? And when we talk about the kingdom, which I will define shortly, I, I'm, I'm actually withholding the definition of the kingdom because I want to keep you in suspense. Okay, and I know some of you have already been in such suspense that you've fallen off to sleep, but please just get up now. Jesus answered, Daniel answered and said in Daniel 2, 20 to 23, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O oh God, my father, uh, of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might. So wisdom and might does not just belong to God, but it can be transferred to a people who want to understand in the world we're living in right now, there's such, such confusion politically, economically, socially. Um, this, this great confusion reigning in the world, and it's a people that must arise now to know the movements of God, the plans of God, the designs of God, and the thoughts of God for the time that we are living in. And I think we have the right to ask God. One of the things God tells us is that we can ask for wisdom. Wisdom in this context is, how do you change times and seasons? What is the emphasis of the signs and seasons? How do you remove kings and raise kings? So when we see somebody not according to our political affiliation placed on a throne, how do we interpret that from the eternal perspective? 
Uh, and how do you give wisdom to the wise? Daniel 2:47. Uh, the king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of the gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal the secret. And you know the secrets are, that Daniel revealed determined s governments and kingdoms that will operate, I think, for millennia. And we are living, I think, in the final aspect of the, the, that dream that Daniel interpreted about the fall, uh, the last phase, which is the feet, the toes of the dream. And these are things the church has to discuss. If, I mean, maybe not every one of us, but these are things that the church needs to know in the time that we are living in. Daniel 4, 1 to 3, Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me, how great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Say to your neighbor, there may be kingdoms in the world, but our God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion is from generation to generation. Say to your neighbor, from generation to generation. So how does God rule? He rules and reigns generationally. Do we play a role in that? Yes. He is sovereign. He is absolute. He is total. He is the supreme God. But if he has to rule, and I'll show you the representative principle, it has to be through a people. Through a people. I can go on and read a whole lot of stuff. Um, you know, um, Jehoshaphat came against three principalities. Moab, Ammon, and the um, well, too specifically, the, the Moabites and the Ammonites. And you know, these are two incestuous sons of Lot. Moab is, is the spirit that kills patriarchy. One of the biggest enemies we have in the church right now and in the world is the enemy that wants to behead fathers. When you decapitate the spirit of father, you create a liberal ideological view of revelation and the purposes of God. To decapitate the spirit of father, Moab means who needs a father, what father, why father. This spirit, this is one of the spirits that almost destroyed the nation of Israel. Uh, this is the, uh, when, when, when Balaam was recruited by the king um, of Moab, he was recruited to bring a curse upon a people that was moving according to family arrangements through the wilderness, and he refused to let them pass through his land because he knew if they passed through the land, he would destroy the, the weapon they had, which is to kill the spirit of fathering. And you know in liberal universities today, patriarchy is a swear word, a swear word. You can't talk about it because it means that... that, uh, that uh, when you talk about fathers today, you, it means uh, uh, oppression against the gender called female in so many forms. I'm using the most simplest way of explaining it to you. And, and, this, and most people today are questioning fathering. And they don't understand that the name of God, and God didn't need to give us a name because he's indescribable. But his ultimate name in the New Testament is not Yah. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And why would he do that? Because he wants us to understand the principle grace resident in the description of himself as father. And if, if we are being created in his image and likeness, and if the final commission that was given by Jesus to the, to the, to the 11 disciples before um, he would ascend was to go into all the world and baptize them in the name, not names, name, singular of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's actually the Genesis chapter 1 mandate, which is go and resubmerge them in the image and likeness of God. And when they come out, they'll have the name Father, they'll have the name Son, and the name, the name Holy Spirit. In other words, they'll look just like us. Okay, and I believe in water baptism, which is another administration. But being baptized into the image and likeness of God is a fundamental. But when the Spirit, when Jehoshaphat came into the valley, where he was going to fight two kings, he was going to fight a principality that 
that decapitates the idea of father, father. And if you understand the principle in the New Testament, and God plays with words, well, the language of Scripture is very narrative and pictorial. But God uses letters and numbers in an allegorical and metaphoric way to express himself. That's why Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. So even in time, like the first day, the second day, the third day, you will find a mystery of God decoded. But it is in that context we need to understand uh, the, that the enemy really wants to destroy the spirit of father, really wants to destroy it, the spirit of patriarchy. And I guess I know there's been bad examples, there's domination, there's suppression, there's manipulation, there's autocracy, there's paternalism, there's control, there's commercialization of the spirit of father. But listen, don't be detracted from the truth. Those are false, spurious detractions that are trying to move you away from the spirit of a true father. And the father in the Godhead is an invisible father, and he's only made visible in his son. He chooses Sabbath rest, meaning that he will only operate through his son. He is always wanting to give two times more to his son than himself. I mean, I've got three sons. I want them to live better than me, do better than me, you know, enjoy greater benefits. Uh, if I go to a restaurant, even if they are working, I want to pay for it because I'm the father. That's the culture of it. And I know there's some very bad examples, but that's not going to stop us and allow that spirit of Moab to come back into the world. And in the valley of Jehoshaphat, he had to fight that spirit of Moab and the spirit of the Ammonite, which encourages fraternity. Ammon means my brother. Moab, who needs a father? And when Lot produced the first son and his daughter called him, Moab, she was basically saying, I only need his seed. I don't need his covering. I'm not interested in marriage. I'm just interested in preserving a lineage. But when you have the absence of a father, then you magnify the spirit of fraternity. That's the Ammonite spirit. And that spirit creates a culture of co-equality and in political language or in ideological language, that's called democracy. That's why one brother will go to another and say, we want you to be our king. And the spirit of the father is destroyed. So they came to do battle against Jehoshaphat, and there's a whole story to this, but in verse 5, then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of my fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And listen, guys, people, this is the time now where I know, you know, I've never taught kingdom the way, because I, I've never felt qualified to teach it. Never. I never felt compelled to teach it. And I've always made, I've made passing references to it. But God said to me in this conference, you release a sound from this platform that my kingdom is coming to a people. Those people better get ready. Because in this generation, something is going to happen. And, and so I know that these words now, we have to take ownership of them. We have to take ownership of them. But there are prerequisites which I want to talk about. And you do not rule over all, uh, 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 and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, listen to this, and the building the sanctuary is a key here. Sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple. And in your presence for your name is in this temple. And you know we are the temple now. And cry out to you in our affliction. And you will hear and 
saved. So building the temple is important before you can even understand God's rule and reign. And now here are the people of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, which is the spirit of Esau, which is another spirit that removes the idea of firstborn. In Christ, we are not the sons of God. In Christ, we are the firstborn sons of God. As he is, so are we. And if he is the first of the firstborns, we'll give him that recognition because he's our king and our Lord. But in Christ, you are seated with him. That's why you're a joint here with him. And the spirit comes, the spirit of Esau, whom you would not let is whom you would not would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. But they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? And these are kind of praise. And we can go to 2 Kings chapter 19. I don't have the time to do it. Verse 15 to 19. Abadiah chapter 1, verses 17 to 21. Dr. Ben mentioned that. That then saviors shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau. Those that have, 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 have not appreciated their birthright status of being a firstborn son. His only firstborn sit at the right hand of the Father. And the kingdoms shall be the Lord's. You can read Daniel chapter 2 verse 44 and 45. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. Say to your neighbor, the kingdom shall not be left to other people. And you are not other people. Say to your neighbor. It's about us. You know, we sing so much of confusion politically in South Africa and in many parts of Africa, leave alone the world. But I think it's time we stop blaming the people who rule. Let's get back to bringing God's kingdom. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces, and the stone here is not the kingdom. The stone here is the church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. So we must talk about the stone today. And it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God that has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain. And its interpretation is sure. And we can go on and read. So let me talk to you about this kingdom. The word kingdom is a very interesting word. In the Greek, it's the word basileia. And that, listen, principally, if you go to study classical Greek, because sometimes when we look at kingdom in the English, we think differently. But if you went to the original meaning of the word kingdom, it speaks about kingship and dominion and royal power. And Dr. Segi done a lot of work on dominion. But it is rule, listen to these words, that must not be confused with an actual kingdom, but rather the right or authority to rule over a domain. So don't think about an actual kingdom because, you know, there's, there's a theology in the world today called dominion theology. And we need to maybe distinguish ourselves from it. We borrow the word dominion from Genesis chapter 1. But when we borrow the word dominion, we are not talking about dominion theology as that group of Christian politicians or, 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 or Christian political ideologies that seek to institute a nation governed by Christians based on Christian understanding of biblical laws. I know that's a very controversial statement. In other words, we don't want to have a to go and convert every single soul and say now you're going to rule you know um, this domain by using biblical laws 
And in many parts of the world, we have that happening to religious extremism like Sharia law, etc. We're not talking about that. We're talking about an authority and a rule that operates in a way that is very unique to what God wants for us. And so we need to define that. So the key with understanding kingdom is the authority to rule. Say to your neighbor, the authority to rule. So don't think about it as, oh, we must, we're only the kingdom when the president in the country becomes a Christian. I would we'd love that to happen. We'd love that to happen for every government. But we have some right now, like in Europe, Germany, in Britain, well, the previous prime minister and so forth, who are practicing Christians, but they have secular countries. So there has to be a greater level of rule. So the key is the authority to rule. Say to your neighbor, the authority to rule or the right to rule, the right to rule. And this authority does not come unless you understand your kingly mantle. So it doesn't happen if we don't understand kingship and we cannot think about kingship from the perspective of the way kings and the earth function. They cannot be our point of reference. But when we talk about the right to rule in the Hebrew, this is what it means. It denotes the reign of a particular sovereign. So if I want to be a part of a rule, and you must hear me carefully, I come from an extremely humble background. My surname by Indian definition may, be, may consider me to be of a certain caste or class in India. Am I correct, Indians from India? I'm not talking about the South African Indians. They're clueless about, <laughs> about what I'm talking about. But you know, my forefathers came as indentured laborers, so I don't know how they were of a higher class in India because they wouldn't work the, the sugarcane fields. So I, I sometimes presume they may have borrowed my surname just to give them a better feeling. Obviously, we cut our teeth in a world of poverty, but we never knew we were poor. We thought to be rich was just to have enough food for every day. That's how we grew up. Our parents couldn't pay our way to university. They were too poor for that. You get converted into the faith, and you start to enjoy great privileges, but you still live from hand to mouth. And as Balusteri said, the way you receive the message of salvation often shapes your behavior for years, that perspective. And so we thought, well, it's great. This world is not our own. Soon and very soon we'll be out of here. When I get to heaven, the rent will be free. That meant we hated the people we paid rent to. Uh, we'll get, you know, then we'll get our mansion and so forth. And so we had this mentality that we, we're supposed to be poor here, yeah, but when we get to heaven, things will change. Yeah. So we lived in what you call a culture of deniable, uh, de deniability, denial, that's a better word, a culture of postponement. We always placed our hope on the distant future, not realizing that when I got saved, I was not saved from hell to go to heaven, but I was saved from being an orphan to become a son of God. I was transferred from a family of aliens and strangers and enemies of God, and I've now been brought into a family where God himself is my papa, my daddy. I'm a, I, my God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. There's no power like him. There's no authority like him. He is sovereign. He is supreme. He is my dad. And because he is that, I am a sovereign. I belong to a royal family. I'm not divine, defined by the sociological definitions of human society. 
class and race and language and status does not dictate who I am because in him he calls me son. He doesn't call me a member of a religious system called Christianity. Son of God. And so if I want to start to exercise authority, I have to understand my identity. I can't just say the kingdom will come if I don't know I'm a son. And I mean, I'm, this is my 33rd year in ministry. Full-time ministry. Three years of that we studied full-time. 33 years in full-time ministry. I studied theology, accumulated knowledge, earned some degrees, and never knew I'm a son of God. I mean, I knew it theoretically, theologically, but I never had an experience with it. It was only in the last 10 years now, I think, or less. I've come to understand I am a son of God and God is my father. I'm no ordinary person. The world may not understand me, but I'm not from the earth. I'm from above. I'm not even born of flesh. I'm born of spirit. Uh, my, the, there's only one God and he's my father. Do you know that kingly authority can never take place without you understanding who you are. I hear people quoting Acts chapter 1 verses, I think it's 7 and 8. If you can put it on the board for me. Um, and Jesus said you will receive Acts, not Colossians. Next verse. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And what does power mean for most of us? Goosebumps. Falling down. Shaking. Manifestations. You know what the word power is in the Greek? It's the word dunamis. And we, yes, for us, dynamite. But there was no dynamite in Acts chapter 1. Like we have Weapons of war now, bullets and cannons and missiles and so forth. So power was, it's, it's not, dynamis is not power as in power. Catch my coat and ten people for. That's showmanship. That's, that's insecure preachers trying to show how powerful they are. The word dynamis comes, gives birth to a word called dynasty. And the word dynasty is the word that speaks of a specific family line. We have the king with us here. Of the Bapedi people. If I may use that as an example. He comes out of a line. He is king Mampupura the third. And he inherits his power from his father. And his father inherits his power from his father. And that line gives him the right to exercise rule, representation, jurisdictional privileges over a certain people group. And, it, and with it come certain privileges. Your power is not based on your goosebumps and how long you prayed and whether you spoke in tongues for two hours. Now, all those things are important. But your power does not come by how you feel. This is an inherent power. And the word inherent means in, yeah. And it's determined by knowing who your li family line is. And if you know that your line can be traced back to God and you are his son, then even if you whisper, demons will flee.
And one of the things that the scriptures tell us about, about this kingdom that we are receiving is that it will be exhibited to, uh, to us through a family line called David, a dynasty, a lineage. When we talk about the tabernacle of David, we talk about the family of David. And I've been fascinated in the last few weeks, I cannot read any other scripture but the life of David. And the more I read it, the more I'm understanding the lineage that I come out of in the spirit. The tribe of Judah. And I'm understanding now that God is expecting me to, to in my humility, comprehend the depth of my authority based upon the fact that authority is only given to those who understand their sovereign privileges, their royal rights. So, like, like, like what Ballesteri just said in the last session, if you think that you're from the earth, you're going to always come to church to get somebody to pray for you and put some oil on your head. You will think the church is incomplete if they don't give you a personal prophecy. And, and, and have an altar call, which is not in the Bible. And we're going to have a consumer, consumeristic culture, and that's why we produce people on pulpits that have taken advantage of the ignorance of people, and they've become, they've become uh, uh, peddlers of God's word. But when you start to know who you are, let me tell you, I may be of a natural lineage of insignificance, but in the spirit, I am the son of God, and that allows me the right to exercise authority. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So God wants us to come to the place of understanding that to talk kingdom is to talk about your right to rule. And wherever you are, the kingdom has come. So without you, there is no kingdom. Because kingdom means the rule or authority of a king. It's made up of two English words. I'm going to use the English. The word king and the word dominion. Dom. King dom. The sovereign rule of God. That's what, when we talk about king, we're talking about the sovereign rule of God. The magisterial reign represented in a people. I'll talk about the principle of representation. You know, I, I could never ever understand certain scriptures in the New Testament, in, in the book of Revelation. Like the, the throne of God and his lamb. And the lamb. And I couldn't understand why God, you'll always say the throne of God and the lamb. There's two people sitting on the throne. And this is what the Lord said to me. He says, the throne of God is represented through a lamb people. I said, what do you mean? He says, the lamb is the most vivid imagery of representation, of deputization. When a lamb died, a whole nation got saved. The lamb was our representative. It's a vicarious principle, which literally meant God does not rule unless he rules through representation. And unless we produce a people who know that wherever you are, because the domain of a king, the second word is domain, which means the territorial reach, the extent of the rule. So no matter where you are, and this is how God is ubiquitously represented. Wherever you are, if it is over a small jurisdiction, as long as you are there and you know who you are, the rule of God has come into that area. That's how we create systemic presence, infectious environments. 
And most people don't want to accept that. Uh, Dr. Ben mentioned last night about how they moved into a piece of property in an area that was pretty relatively primitive, farm, rural, uh, you know, rural. And um, immediately roads were being tarred. The whole area upgraded, properties started to, the prices picked up. I remember when we were in Peter Maritzburg, we bought a piece of property in an area that was remote. And um, immediately the entire area started to upgrade itself. Let me tell you something. The well-being of the earth is not determined by the governments of this world. It's determined by how a people position themselves and administrate their spheres of rule. It may just be over your kitchen, so please keep it clean. No matter how big or how small the extent of your rule is, that is the fundamental. I'm going to just drop a few thoughts, and I think I'll get one more session to, to finish off some of the things that I want to say. I was looking at the life of, of Jesus in Mark chapter 1. And I want to read this to you. Mark chapter 1. And we're all very familiar with some of the things. But I think we need to situate this within the context. Mark 1, verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now look at this, because a lot of people don't see this, but they want to quote the latest scriptures. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered to him. So mark the words. Jesus did not come out of the water and say the kingdom has come. Can you see it? After he came out of the water and the Holy Spirit took over the leadership of the life of Jesus, he had to be taken into the wilderness and he was there for 40 days. And we know the testing he went, into, uh, he went through, a rigorous testing in the wilderness. And what was the test? Are you the son of God? So you cannot talk kingdom if you do not talk sonship. Because we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of the only begotten of the Father. Romans 8.29 And then there's another thing that happened. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So there had to be also the shutting down of another voice in the earth. The beheading of John before Jesus could say, the kingdom, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So what are the steps to getting to the place where we can start becoming a demonstrative people, declaring the kingdom of God? Step number one, I believe, is that you have to be born again. And we'll talk about that later because Jesus said that you cannot see or enter the kingdom unless you're born from above and you're born of the water and the spirit. But being born again does not give you the jurisdictional privilege, the executive right to preach the kingdom. If you read what we read early on from Isaiah, the child has to become a son. 
I've often asked myself, oh God, why is the church not realizing all the promises you've made? We should be richer than the natural Jew. We should be more blessed than the natural seed of Israel, of Abraham, of Abram. Why is it the church is not producing the kind of people we should? And the Lord said to me, as long as the hare is a child, he is under servants, custodians, and guardians until the time appointed by the Father, which is sonship. That's the first step. The second step is going through what I would call the wilderness of preparation. And the wilderness of preparation is a place of isolation, of hiddenness, of invisibility. God himself had to be relatively hidden. Imagine Emmanuel being with you, and for 30 years we don't have a record of it. Only for a brief moment when he was 12. We don't know whether he performed miracles like folklore and tradition would say. We don't know whether he was an extraordinary child, even though he grew in grace and favor. And he grew unto the Lord and unto men. He grew in, uh, in stature and he grew in wisdom. Yes, we know those things, but we don't know the full story. But he had to be developed. That's the maturation process. And only when he came to the place of submission to, to the will of God, and he did not submit to water baptism, he submitted to righteousness. And righteousness demanded that he gets washed. The lamb had to get washed, and we'll talk about that later. Then only did the father declare after 30 years, imagine 30 wasted years, God in the flesh, because the baby could perform, by our estimate, the same things a mature man could, because he's God. God chose not to. So if we want to see maturation, then maturation is a very important thing. We call it the teleos moment. The word perfect does not mean without blemish or spot. It means mature, complete. Then God declared, this is my son. But the declaration did not mean he could say the kingdom has come. He had to go and get tested. And the test was, are you really the son of God? Only when he passed the test and waited for John the Baptist to be completely removed, then he could start speaking the kingdom of God has come. And I want to talk about in the next session how we build the church to become God's corporate son through whom the kingdom of God will come. And I believe that we have a first fruit company in the earth that can become an, an expression of that. Amen? How many of you want the rule, the right to rule? So grow up. Get connected to all those impartational graces so that the spirit of sonship can come back into our lives. Because let me tell you something. Most of us are functioning as Christians, not as the sons of God. Amen? Stand with me. Just lift your hands to God. My time is up.